So hello, everybody. Uh, my name is Dylan Sierra Rodena, and I'd like to welcome everyone to the Cambridge Festival as hosted by the Department of Physiology, Neuroscience and Development. Today, we have an array of talks spanning these three expansive fields, and it's going to be a really great day for talking about some really cool science. So just a little bit of housekeeping. Feel free to converse in the chat off to the right hand side. And as well, uh, I'll be keeping an eye on that chat. So if you have any questions there, I will pick them up and I will then be able to ask them at the end of the talk. So without further ado, I'd like to introduce our first speaker, who is Dr. Hugh Matthews, who will be presenting a talk titled The Darkness into Light, Vision, Contrast and Sensitivity. Hello, everybody. I'm Dr. Hugh Matthews. I'm a sensory neuroscientist and electrophysiologist working on, among other things, um, photoreceptor cells within the visual system. And I'm going to be telling you today about how the visual system can operate over a truly enormous range of intensity. Because every day, light changes from very dim. Imagine you're on a moonless night under a starlit sky, very, very dark conditions indeed, um, through um, moonlit nights, early dusk, early dawn, late dusk, all the way through to very, very intense light uh, under the midday sun. And the visual system has got to cope with this truly enormous range of intensity. And it really is enormous. A white sheet of paper would be about a billion times brighter in outdoor sunlight than on a starry moonless night. But do we actually see this enormous intensity range at one and the same time? Does the visual system really have to cope with this billion fold or more range at any given moment? And the simple answer to that question is no, it does not. Because most objects do not emit light. Instead, they reflect light from some external light source, such as my light bulb here. So when the light from the light source um, hits the object, it's reflected. And if it were reflected from the white stripe of my little knitted zebra, the white stripe would reflect a lot of light. And we'd like our visual system to adjudge that stripe as being a white one. But if instead, and we'd say that that white stripe has a high reflectance, it's very good at reflecting light. But if instead a ray of light from the light bulb um, hits a black stripe or the zebra's black nose, um, the black nose will reflect rather little light. And we'd like our visual system to adjudge this as being black because it has a low reflectance. It's very bad at reflecting light. Now, so even though light changes from dim to bright every day, um, the reflectances of objects in the real world are not going to change. And if you have any sense, you don't spend your time staring at the disk of the midday sun. That would do your retina no good at all. Um, so this enormous brightness range of the illuminating light is translated into a much smaller range of intensities reflected back from the visual world at any, any given moment. And we can appreciate that by realizing that a white surface only reflects about 20 times more light than a black surface. A very high reflectance white surface, um, a freshly painted white wall, for example, painted in brilliant white paint, um, would reflect about 95% um, of the incident light. If you try really, really hard, you might get up to 98% of the incident light, but that would be pushing it. Whereas a black surface, let us say the surface of black velvet, which um, not only is not good at reflecting light, but scatters it in all sorts of different directions, might reflect somewhere between two and 5% of the instant light. Going below 2% reflectance is very, very difficult. And as a result, the range of intensities we've got to cope with at any given moment is much smaller. And the relative difference between the amount of light reflected from a white surface and that reflected from a black surface won't actually change. It will still be about 20 times as much as is reflected from a black surface, even though the absolute intensity of light reflected changes a lot. So the pattern of light and dark does not depend on how bright the light is, but instead on how good a particular object is at reflecting it. So what vision is looking for is relative differences in brightness 
between the bright regions, the high reflectance regions of the visual world, and the dark regions, the low reflective um, reflectance regions in the visual world. And we refer to these relative differences as being visual contrast. Now, I can sense you thinking, but is my visual system really doing that? I thought I was very good at judging how bright things are. I'd like to convince you um, that that is in fact not the case by demonstrating to you what is known as the simultaneous contrast illusion. This slide shows a stepped background like a staircase, dark at one end and bright at the other, um, going up in steps of gray. And superimposed on it is a bar which appears to ramp smoothly from light gray at one end through to dark gray at the other end. And this is a very powerful percept. The bar appears to ramp, but I'd like to convince you that in fact, it's doing no such thing by blocking off the staircase background, the stepped background, so you can only see the bar. And if I do that, maybe a little bit jerky in this um, zoomed video call, you can see that the bar is actually the same all the way along. It's just a middle gray all the way along. So why did it appear to be brighter at one end, the left-hand end, and darker at the other, the right-hand end? The reason is that your visual system is making a comparison between the bar and the background at each point along its length. At this end, the bar is a lot brighter than the background, so it's being assigned a light gray intensity by your visual system. At the other end, the bar is much darker than the background, and so your visual system decides it must be dark. So we've tricked the visual system by using the mechanism, by confusing the mechanism that it usually uses to extract um, information about contrast. Let's now get a little bit technical. Let's plot the brightness of the um, reflected light against the brightness of the illuminating light source, the amount of light reflected from a light or dark bit of the zebra as a function of the brightness of the light bulb. And I'm doing this on what are known as logarithmic axes. A log axis is very clever. Each unit on the log axis represents a tenfold change. So every time we go one unit along the log illuminance axis, that's how bright the light bulb is, we make the light 10 times brighter. So 10 times, 100 times, 1,000 times brighter, and so forth. And exactly the same on the um, y-axis, which plots out the brightness of a particular region on the stripey zebra. Um, let's plot out the amount of light reflected from a white stripe as a function of the brightness of the light bulb. Every time you make the light bulb 10 times brighter, the amount of light reflected from the white stripe will get 10 times bigger. So we'll move up this thin line um, as the light becomes brighter, um, simply reflecting a constant proportion of the incident light. Exactly the same will be true of the black nose of the zebra. The difference is that for any particular light bulb intensity, it will reflect less light but as we make the light from the light bulb brighter and brighter, the absolute amount of light reflected by both the black regions and the white regions gets proportionately greater. So if we make the light more than a thousand times brighter, everything will reflect more than a thousand times more light. And our visual system will have to cope with this brighter range of intensities and make relative judgments within it. To do that, the visual system has got to constantly change its sensitivity. And you can think of this as being like a sort of automatic gain control or automatic volume control for visual sensitivity. And we refer to this process of adjusting the sensitivity of the visual system as light adaptation. And in fact, that's one of the mechanisms that my lab works on within individual photoreceptors within the retina, about which I'll say a little bit more later on in the talk. But for now, let's keep things simple. Let's look at the eye itself and ask how we respond to light. Well, the eye is rather like a little camera. Its optical system is forming an inverted image of the world on the retina. And the retina is rather like the film on the back of the camera or a modern digital camera, the digital image sensor. 
we have a photosensitive um, layer at the very back of the eye containing the photoreceptor cells, which actually respond to light. Then layers of neural wiring that process these signals. And finally, um, the cells that send their nerve fibers along the optic nerve to the brain um, so that we can interpret and analyze what we've seen. Now, there are two kinds of photoreceptor cells within the retina. The rods, um, long elongated rod-like cells, as I say, these are among the cells my own lab works on, and the cones, shorter, stubbier, and as we'll see in a moment, in certain parts of the human retina, very numerous and very closely packed together. And we use different photoreceptors in different ranges of intensity. In the very low intensity range, we use the rods to see the world in black and white. But when the light becomes brighter than twilight or um, dawn, um, the cones come into play. And they are used, as we'll see in a little while, in color vision. There's an overlap region in the middle where we're using both rods and cones. But once the rods have run out of steam and saturated so they can't respond anymore, the cones take over and we see the world in much more detail and in color. But at very low light intensities, only the rods can function and we see the world in black and white, and as we'll see soon, in rather low resolution. So let's look at how these receptors are distributed over the retina. If you think about it, it doesn't make much sense to refer to the absolute sizes of objects and images on the retina, because as an object in the real world, it moves further away, um, it appears to get smaller and smaller. It makes much more sense to follow the trajectory um, the path followed by a ray of light from some particular point of the object, and look where that particular point on the object is imaged on the retina. And to express that as an angle of displacement away from the very central region of the human retina called the fovea. So in this example, I'd be looking, let's say, at um, uh, let's flip our candle up, upside down. That would be another, um, that would be something very, very much at the bottom of the candle. Um, it will form an image of that particular point on the candle at a position displaced in the opposite direction on the retina, in this particular case at a visual angle of 30 degrees away from the fovea. Using that scale of angle, visual angle, let's look at how the rods and cones are distributed across the human retina, starting off at the very centre, the fovea. In the fovea, in the human, there are very, very few rods, but extremely densely packed cones. And as we'll see in a moment, this allows central human vision to be very detailed indeed. But as we move away from the fovea, the density of cones falls away precipitously and the density of rods rises. So um, at about that point there, we've got rather sparsely packed, bigger cones, um, and little rods, the purple ones, packed in between them. And if we move to the periphery of the retina, the cones are very, very sparse indeed, and most of um, the receptors we see will be rods. So why does the high cone density in the fovea matter? Well, to resolve detail in bright light, we've got to be able to see the difference between parts of the image that stimulate cones and parts of the image that don't. Um, so to see this letter E, we would need an unstimulated cone in between each stimulated cone so that we could see the dark gap between the two red prongs. If the E were smaller, we wouldn't be able to see that it was a letter E because we wouldn't actually reliably see the gaps. We'd simply see a blurry red blob. This would not be resolved. So to resolve fine detail, we need to point the very tightly packed cones of the human fovea at that point of interest on the object. And we also have to have bright enough light that the cones can function. But when the light is very dim, we use our rod photoreceptors instead. And therefore, if you want to see something very dim, 
For example, if you want to see a dim star in the dark night sky, it'd be a good idea to look to one side of it so that you point your cone dense fovea away from the object you're interested in and allow the image of the star to fall on your very densely packed rods in this region a little bit to one side or the other of the fovea. Now, let's contrast the human with the cat. Cats hunt at night. My cat certainly hunts at night and occasionally brings little offerings back to place on the doorstep for the next morning. And the cat retina mostly uses rods. There are an enormous number of rods in the cat retina, even in its very central region, position one, and rather few cones. Perhaps even in this central region, 10 rods for each cone. And as we move more peripherally and the cone density falls away, um, the ratio of rods per cone becomes even larger, ever larger. And that means that the cat can see very well in the dark because it has um, highly sensitive rods at all locations within its retina. But what is the nature of the image that rods will see? Well, light is not continuous, but it's instead composed of particles of light or photons. So a dim steady light is a stream of single photons arriving randomly at some mean rate that would correspond to the brightness of that particular point on the image. And to detect the image, we've got to actually detect the photons. Like, since you're thinking, why is this a problem? Let's imagine how we're going to detect um, the individual photons, how we can make it a reliable process. Well, you saw in my earlier scanning electron micrograph, the picture of the rods and the cones, that rods have very long um, photosensitive parts of their cells called the outer segments. And within these outer segments, there's a stack of membranous, membranous disks, rather like a stack of pennies inside the cell. And the molecule that actually absorbs light, a molecule called rhodopsin, the photopigment, is contained within these membranous disks. And these disks are stacked up along the rod like a stack of pennies. And um, because we've got perhaps a thousand disks within each outer segment, we have a very large number of um, rhodopsin molecules stacked up within those disks. And therefore, this large number of pigment molecules makes it likely that as light passes along the length of the outer segment, the photon will in fact be absorbed. It's not a certainty, but about two thirds of the time it will nonetheless get absorbed if it's of the right wavelength, a sort of blue-green wavelength, very close in fact to what's called Cambridge blue. And rods actually can respond to individual single photons. This is a picture from my own lab of an individual salamander, a rod photoreceptor, whose electrical responses are being recorded by this glass pipette, allowing the recording of the responses to single photons. Let's imagine we present very dim flashes of light. Um, every now and then, rhodopsin catches a photon and there's a little response, but sometimes the photon makes it to the far end of the outer segment without getting absorbed. Hmm, there we had a failure, there another failure, there a success, there another success. And here I think we got incredibly lucky. Two photons were absorbed at the same time from the same flash and we got a bigger response. So um, individual rods can indeed respond to single photons. These dim flashes can evoke single photon responses. And the same will be happening when the rods within our own retiny um, respond to very, very dim um, light. So what will be the consequence for the image that we see when light is very dim? Well, when the light's very dim indeed, we will be catching so few photons that the image will be very noisy. I would challenge you from this image produced way back in the 1950s using a very high sensitivity, um, digital, uh, sorry, high sensitivity um, electro electronic camera, not digital in those days, in fact, too long ago, I would challenge you to tell from this image 
um, showing the um, single photons arriving and being caught by the camera, what this is actually an image of. So it's rather like a pattering of raindrops on a roof, the arrival of single photons. When the rate of falling of raindrops is very low, um, the um, density where you've got more or where you've got fewer hitting in each given area is really not plain. You can see there's something there in the middle, but what it is is very unclear. But if I make the light a little brighter, you start seeing a ghostly face. It's somebody's face. And we can make it a little bit brighter still. You can definitely see it's somebody's face. And a bit brighter still, hmm, it appears to be a female face. Um, certainly longer hair. Now we can see more, more detail. Now we're moving probably into the range where your cones would start responding and giving you more detail still. And so as the light becomes brighter and brighter, the noisiness of the image diminishes. Now I can sense you thinking, but why can't we see in detail even at low intensities with our tightly packed rod photoreceptors? Because there were a lot of rods per unit area, both in the human and the cat. Won't rods let us see detail after all? Well, the answer is, as you've just seen, that there isn't detail there to be obtained. The rate of arrival of photons is so low that we can't really use the fine grain of the array of rods. Instead, we want to add the signals from our rod photoreceptors together to make a bigger bucket to catch photons in. And that's exactly what the retina does. It adds together the signals from many rod photoreceptors to send the signals from perhaps some 1500 photoreceptors um, out along a single optic nerve fiber. So the probability of one of these rods catching a photon is reasonably good. Um, and so the optic nerve can signal along that particular fiber, I've seen something, but the detail of exactly what it was isn't resolvable on a fine spatial grain. So we've smoothed out the noise, but we've destroyed our ability to use the rods to see fine detail. So what does determine the dimmest light that you can see? Well, to work this out, let's not use a human, but instead a toad. And we use a toad for the following reason. Heat can excite rhodopsin too, but much, much less well than light. And amphibia, including toads, are cold-blooded, so we can change their temperature, their environmental temperature, and therefore change the rate at which um, individual rhodopsin molecules in the rods will be excited by heat. And the toad is in near darkness, minding its own business. It's presented in these very dim light conditions with a white dummy worm underneath a perspex screen. And toads, when they see what appears to be a worm wiggling, strike at it with their tongue um, to try and eat it. And um, if you look for the intensity at which the toad strikes at the dummy worm with its tongue, it means that it can then see the dummy worm. Let's plot out um, that um, absolute threshold at which the toad will strike at the dummy worm. And against it, again, these are on log coordinates. Note each unit, each big tick gets 10 times bigger. And plot against that the rate at which we would expect rhodopsin to be um, spontaneously excited by heat. As the eye gets warmer, the um, rhodopsin is excited more frequently by heat. And um, even more noise is therefore added to the um, background above which we've got to detect that there's actually something there. The more noise, the harder this becomes. So the more light and the more photon absorptions, we need to do that. And that's exactly what you see happening here. As the temperature increases, um, the um, absolute threshold progressively increases and the rate at which rhodopsin is excited increases and they increase in tandem. Every time you make the toad um, sufficiently much warmer, to um, increase the absolute threshold by a factor of 10. It does so because the rate of isomerization increases by a factor of 10 also. And humans, at 
normal human body temperature are much worse than this than toads because we're warmer and therefore rhodopsin is being excited by heat at a higher rate even in complete darkness. How can we do better? How can a cat do better than a human? Well, any cat owners or anyone who's seen a cat on a dark night when the car is driving towards the cat will know that a cat's eyes reflect light. And the reason they do so is that they've got a shiny layer at the back of their retina called the antepetum lucidum, which in Latin literally means shiny carpet. And the shiny carpet or antepetum lucidum reflects light back again through the retina. Why might this be a useful thing to do? What it means is that light is going to pass through the retina twice over. The photon might get, in, might get absorbed by the photoreceptor on the first pass through the retina, but if it doesn't, it'll get reflected back again and get a second go. So this allows the cat to try and use every available photon in its very numerous rods and thereby increase its sensitivity. The problem for the cat is that um, if you absorb light here, it would appear to be from a point that point on the visual image. And if you absorb it there, it would appear to be from that point on the retinal image. So this process of a double pass of light through the retina, the reflection of light, makes the image more blurry than it otherwise would be. But the cat's using its rods where the image is already rather low resolution. So it doesn't care. Arctic reindeer have a rather clever trick they change the color of their tapetum between winter and summer. If you were to look deep into the eyes of an Arctic reindeer in summer, you would see a beautiful golden green color. But in winter, a much lower reflectance, um, deep blue. Very little light is referred, reflected in winter, and it is of a shorter wavelength, blue rather than golden yellow. So both less light is reflected out and of a different wavelength. Why might that be useful? Well, if less light is reflected out in winter, more light is scattered within the retina and therefore may get absorbed. Whereas in the summer, reflected light passing out um, is simply lost. So this scattering of light within the um, winter eye makes the reindeer more sensitive in winter than it would be in summer. And the mechanism it uses to change the color of its tapetum is almost pathological, really. In the winter, the extraocular pressure within the eyeball increases, almost blowing it up a little bit like a little balloon. That in a human would be called glaucoma. And if it were to persist for too long, it would actually kill the photoreceptors and other cells in the retina and lead to blindness. But in the reindeer, this mild glaucoma squashes the fibers of the tapetum, which reflect light together, so that they are closer together and reflect and scatter light at shorter wavelengths and scatter light more effectively. So a sort of seasonal glaucoma, mild seasonal glaucoma, lets the reindeer see with greater sensitivity in the winter than in the summer. Now to see the world in color, we use our less sensitive cones. And human vision responds to sunlight, which contains um, all the colors of the rainbow. We've evolved to respond to this range of wavelengths from blue-violet at one end of the spectrum, through blue, through green, through yellow, then orange and red. Um, and our cones have got to sample these different wavelengths to provide us with um, an a reliable image of what we have actually seen. Let's go back to our little stripy zebra, but this time a colorful zebra, and again, illuminate it from an external light source. If a particular stripe, let's say this stripe here, um, is good at reflecting um, short wavelengths of light, blue, we would like the visual system to say, I've seen a blue stripe. If instead it reflects a long wavelength of light or red, we'd like our visual system to say, that's a red stripe. Now, why is that a problem? Well, it's a problem because vision has got to try to work out what colors something can reflect. That's known as the object spectral reflectance, irrespective of the color of the illuminating light. 
And in the real world, illuminating light changes quite a lot. So we would like our visual system to be able to judge colors, whatever happens to the um, illuminating light. We'd refer to that constancy as color constancy. But light from different sources varies tremendously. Average daylight is quite well behaved. Um, plotting out the relative intensity as a function of the wavelength. But artificial light can be really weird. This is the spectrum fluorescent tube and it's got spikes in the violet, the blue, the green and the greeny yellow. And then this fuzziness in between. And we'd like our visual system to be able to judge colors irrespective of whether we're looking at the objects under daylight or fluorescent light or tungsten light or something else. So how can we judge spectral reflectance reliably? The answer is by looking for differences in color. And this is known as the process of color contrast. In this example, the red pepper pops out from its background of green Granny Smith apples really very obviously. You can immediately see there's a red pepper there. You don't have to search for it. How do we do this? Well, humans have three different kinds of cone photoreceptor responding to blue, green, and red wavelengths. So roughly speaking, we call them blue sensitive, green sensitive, and red sensitive cones. The blue sensitive cones respond to the um, bluey violet wavelengths, the green to the yellowy um, greeny, and the red slightly longer, it's doing better in the reddy orangey region of the spectrum. So how might we use these three classes of cone when looking at a colorful object? Let's use as an example, an apple tree with green leaves and red apples. The green leaves will, unsurprisingly, be very good at reflecting blue-green wavelengths, especially these greeny ones in the middle of the spectrum, whereas the red apples will be reflecting the longer wavelengths much better. And as a result, um, when we look at what is present using each individual type of cone, we find that in response to the um, green leaves, our green sensitive cones are responding very well. And when looking at the red apples, our red sensitive cones are responding very well. And it's by using the balance between these different cone responses that the brain can decide what color an object actually is and whether or not it's different from its background. So, Human beings have three cones. We're therefore said to be trichromatic. And this trichromacy means that if we pick reasonably sensible primary colors, let's say blue, green, and red, we can blend these together in appropriate proportions to match a test light. And this, of course, is the principle being used by the display screen you're looking at at the moment. The display screen is mixing red, green, and blue light to present um, the perception of different colors by appropriately stimulating your different cone classes. How well a particular display screen does this will determine how accurate its representation of what you might really see in real life will be. So why is it useful to humans and other old world primates to be trichromatic? Well, without separate green and red cones, um, you cannot see fresh leaves and ripe fruit. So when some tens of billions of years ago, old world primates produced, if you like, a mutant version of what was previously a yellowish pigment, so thereby producing red and green separate cone pigments, this was quite a useful survival feature. And so was evolutionarily retained by natural selection. In contrast to primates, um, which may have three different cones. Most mammals, dogs and cats and farm animals, have just two, blue sensitive and greeny yellow sensitive. So a human can very easily tell a Braeburn apple from a Granny Smith apple. The Braeburn apple is nice and red and rosy and the Granny Smith is, looks green. Um, perfectly tasty, but it's green. But to a horse, um, both of them would look golden yellow, just like a russet apple. I think the horse will probably accept either of them, so um, that will be just fine for the horse. But if you are a canopy-dwelling primate searching for ripe fruit, ripe fruit, being able to tell red from green is clearly a plus. 
Many birds, in contrast, are tetrachromats. Tetra meaning they have four cone classes, and they have an extra pigment in the ultraviolet, allowing them to see even richer colors than we can. So color vision is looking for differences in color. And there are two different ways in which it might do so. It can look for differences within an object. Is a particular region a bit greener or a bit redder, or a bit yellower or a bit bluer? We would call this color opponency within an object. Alternatively, it can look across the boundaries of an object between the object and its background, such as the situation with my red pepper on the bed of green Granny Smith apples. Is the object redder or greener than its background, or yellower or bluer than its background? This is referred to as color contrast. And I'd like to convince you over the next few slides that your visual systems really are extracting these different sorts of information, starting with color opponency. This illusion is um, a rather nice demonstration created by the Japanese psychophysicist Akiyoshi Kitaoka and it demonstrates the process of color opponency. I'd like you to look very steadily at the little black cross in the middle of this slide and keep doing so for the next 10 or 15 seconds. Just stare at the black cross, don't look away from it. Then I'm going to move one slide forwards and I'd like you to keep looking at the black cross, don't look away from it. And what you should then see is a series of dots appearing of the opposing colors, the um, contrasting color, colors in the white region in between. And the reason that this happened when I jumped the columns of colored dots to one side is that the cells signaling different colors within each individual little um, circle had adapted and stopped responding to that particular color. So when I presented white, which stimulates all cone classes equally, this looked like the opponent color because we'd upset the balance between the different um, color signals. Let's now look at an example of color contrast. In this slide, and again, the palette of colors I've used was selected by Akiyoshi Kitaoka. Um, it shows a pink square on the left side, a big pink square and a big green square on the right side. And superimposed on these big squares are little squares of approximately the same gray. Maybe little differences on your screen, but they should look approximately the same. Actually, that's a complete illusion, as I can show by sliding the squares, little squares sideways. And you can see, sorry about the jerkiness, this is the problem with Zoom, you can see that they're actually extremely different. So why did they originally appear the same? And why do they now look even more different than they really are when superimposed on the other background? Well, this is an example of color contrast. The red background makes the square look greener and the green background makes the square look redder. And this can be used to practical effect. If any of you have ever visited um, Walt Disney World in Florida, um, in the Epcot Center, the foliage and the grass looks wonderfully green. And there's a visual reason for that. Walt Disney um, commissioned Kodak in the 1950s to choose the shade of the pink pavement to literally make the grass look greener through um, color contrast. The grass really does look greener at Disney World. Now we need differences to tell what color things are. And we need to do this all the way through the normal day because um, with an external light source such as the sun, some objects will be in direct sunlight and some will be in shade. And also the illuminating light changes in color as the sun rises or sets. Just after sunrise or just before sunset, we have the golden hour. Everything looks very golden and very wonderful. Amateur photographers make use of that to make um, landscapes look extremely beautiful. And just before the sun rises or just after the sun sets, we have the blue hour when scattered light from the sky makes everything look blue. And we've still got to be able to judge relative colors as best we can. Even in the middle of the day, um, direct light from the sun is a bit yellower and um, in the shadows 
there's more scattered blue light from the sky. So the balance between yellow and blue changes between direct sunlight and shade. And that can in fact be useful. Objects are dimmer and more blue in the shadows. And that is a good way of telling that you are seeing a shadow rather than a real edge. So your visual system is trying to compensate for sun and shade to find out what objects in those different regions of the image are really capable of reflecting. Let's try and trick this system. Comparisons between these different regions, what's happening in each region, normally let us see as colors as constant. For example, you might say in this region of direct sunlight, mm, those green leaves are very good at reflecting middle wavelengths um, compared to the things around them. They therefore must be green. Even in the shadows, we're comparing objects with things immediately next to them. Let's try and trick this system with a synthetic image by using a cartoon created again by my favorite psychophysicist, Jap Japanese psychophysicist Akiyoshi Kitioka, showing a cartoon of a little Japanese girl, half of whose face is illuminated with white light and half of whose face is in a shadow illuminated with blue light. And she's got a yellow hair bead in her hair and Hmm, that's odd. She's got one yellow eye and one gray eye. The yellow eye, in fact, looks remarkably like the yellow hair bead. But is it really so? Let's find out by blocking out the blue on the left-hand side of the image. And if I do this, if I slide down a little mask, blocking out the blue background, you can see that the two eyes are actually exactly the same. So why did the eye on the blue side appear to be yellow? The answer is, our visual system was doing the best it could to judge what color the eye must be based on the assumption that that half of her face really was illuminated with blue light. But the eye wasn't reflecting enough blue light. Therefore, it must have been yellow, thought our visual system. This is meant to help you see the real colors in a real shadow. But by using this synthetic image, we've tricked the visual system, confused it, um, with this simulated image to create an illusion. Now at sunset, scattered light from the sun is very red and so red in fact that we haven't got a wide enough range of colors to make a proper judgment for color constancy. So at that point, really at the end of the golden hour, color constancy tends to fail and colors do look wonderfully golden. Um, try it the next time you have a nice um, red sunset and you'll find the world is a very golden and um, happy looking place. And what we expect the lighting can be can govern what we actually perceive. A famous internet meme of a few years ago is the meme of the dress, which some people saw as being gold and white. It in fact was a gold and white dress, but some people perceived as being a black and blue dress. Why might that be? Well, psychological experiments have shown that expectation very much governs whether you see it as gold and white or black and blue. If you're an early riser, you're assuming blue tinted light and you see it as white and gold. But if you are a night owl used to um, either sunset or yellowish artificial light, you see blue black, you're assuming yellow light. So um, the majority in fact, in that particular psychological experiment fell into the um, yellow light category, the night owl category. Now you may be thinking, no, I couldn't be fooled like that, could I? Well, actually you could. Here's a rather nice synthetic image um, designed by Kasuga, Kasuga, showing a cartoon of this dress image. Um, and again, splitting the image into a shadowed and a direct um, section. On the left-hand side, black and blue. On the right-hand side, gold and um, white. But you can see from these little pipes running from one side to the other, 
that the dress and the apron are exactly the same on both sides in the shadowed region. But a very powerful expectation has been generated on each side that this is a non-uniformly illuminated figure. And try as you might, it is almost impossible to make the percept shift from what you've been led to believe. So your visual system is capable of tricking you quite considerably. The mechanisms that we use under normal circumstances to try and see the world as it really is can sometimes be fooled to make you see something quite, quite different. And on that note, let me finish with a final slide that appears to show a very bright light shining from the middle of the screen from among these petal-like segments. So is the screen really brighter in the middle? Could it be brighter in the middle? Let's find out by blanking off the petals. Little jerky again, but you can see that actually the screen in the middle is exactly the same. And we've been fooled into thinking that it's different through the progressive gradient of brightness along each petal, which makes us think that the light must be getting brighter behind them as well. Only it isn't, it's exactly the same. So I hope I've convinced you that light and dark are important, that the visual system has some very clever mechanisms within itself to sort out this enormous range of intensity, and that these mechanisms can be tricked to produce a number of quite um, dramatic illusions. Thank you for your attention. Thank you very much for a very illuminating talk. Now, I... I'm looking towards the chat right now. For those who are watching, uh, please feel free to ask any questions there and I can communicate them to our speaker. Uh, I have a couple myself. Uh, one in particular, you were talking about uh, the various cones and how they receive uh, the various wavelengths of light. How does that relate to color blindness? I'm not quite sure if you caught my question, uh, but I was asking question. about color blindness and color how blindness. it relates to cones. Color blindness is great fun. Um, had time permitted, I could have said a lot about color blindness. Um, as I said earlier, in evolutionary terms, um, the red and the green pigments in humans are relatively um, new um, inventions. Um, tens of millions of years ago, but in evolutionary time, it's the blink of an eye, and they're very close together on the human X chromosome. What that means is mistakes can occur. What sorts of mistakes might those be? Well, when um, creating a gamete in uh, meiosis, um, you are crossing over chromosomes, you're selecting what you um, want to send on to the um, gamete. And the problem is, you can either delete one of these red and or green pigments, producing an X chromosome that only has red or only has green, or perhaps even more confusingly, produce a hybrid pigment instead of a red or a green, one that's sort of half and half. Um, the result of that half and halfness is a pigment that would respond to the yellow. Now, a human genetic male has just one X chromosome. If you inherit an X chromosome that has a missing cone pigment, you will not be able to um, respond differently to that particular wavelength, range of wavelengths. You might lack a red cone pigment. You would therefore only be using your green cones to look at that medium to longish range of the spectrum. So you wouldn't really be able to tell red from green. That person would be red-green colorblind. If you were to inherit a, a hybrid pigment, let's say a half and half, instead of either your red or your green pigment, you would see the world as a trichromat, but you'd be different from the usual trichromat. You would be a so-called anomalous trichromat. Now, um, you might be thinking, hmm, so is there such a thing as a color normal human? Actually, no, there are quite common polymorphisms that have very, very subtle effects on exactly where the red pigment, which range of wavelengths the red pigment responds to. So in that sense, there's no such thing as a precisely color normal. In some other species, it gets even stranger. <laughs> interesting. Uh, I had another question also about uh, kind of the dim light part where you mentioned that oftentimes uh, in humans, 
when it's dim light, uh, more and more rods are being used. Is there a sort of buffering system where the brain kind of waits for more information in order to click something to make an image? You're in a sense buffering right out at the sharp end at the receptor itself. Rods respond really rather slowly, especially when the light is dim. You're collecting together light over what's called the receptor's integration time. So in a sense, you're buffering up in the receptor itself. Have I seen a photon recently? Have I seen a photon recently? When the light's really dim, that integration time is quite long. In, a, in an amphibian, you're talking about um, a second or so. They really are that slow at um, really dim intensities. Humans, it's not as bad, but you can track this and also the speed of the um, rest of the visual pathway through the retina all the way up to the center by using what's known as the flicker fusion frequency. Um, that is the frequency at which a flickering light appears to be steady. And you might think, hmm, so is that really a thing? Well, lots of light sources, artificial light sources around you are flickering all the time, but they're flickering um, at 100 times a second, double the mains frequency, and that's above the flicker fusion frequency even of the cones. It's too fast for the cones to see as a flicker. Um, the rod system is more sluggish. You can cheat it and make it think, even when the light's quite bright for a rod, that a flickering light at 20 flickers a second is steady. Cones can see that as flickering. The rods say, mm, as far as we're concerned, it's steady. And go dim, the rods get even more sluggish.